Welcome to In Production, conversations on the research and development of time-based artworks. Hosted by MPAX engineering and curatorial staff, we talk to artists, technicians, curators, scholars, and makers associated with the production of new work here at the Curtis R. Priam Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center on the campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Through interdisciplinary exchange, this podcast series contributes insight into the creative and technical act of producing artistic works by those who work backstage and behind the camera. Hello, and welcome to episode two of MPAX in Production. It's taken a little while for us to get this out, but surprise, surprise, we have been in production for most of the fall, and we have not really had a lot of time to make this happen. So I am very excited that we get to do it today, and I'll be talking with Clarissa Tosin and Jeremy Glayholt um, in regards to the film Before the Volcanoes Sing, which was filmed at MPAC, produced with MPAC, and post-production done here as well that premiered this fall. For the Volcano Sing is scored by the Brazilian composer Michelle Agnes Megalhaes and performed by Mexican flautist Alicia Lozano Barreta, Ixil Maya artist Tohil Fidel Brito, and Quiche Cachiquel Maya poet Rosa Chavez. The film takes a sonic approach to the articulation of architectural borrowings by Western architects of indigenous cultural motifs, utilizing 3D printed replicas of Mayan wind instruments from pre-Columbian collections held in U.S. and Guatemalan museums. So Clarissa worked in collaboration with the anthropologist and archaeologist Jared Katz, the associate curator of the Americas and Africa, at the Snipe Museum of Art at the University of Notre Dame to take these flutes and scan them into 3D models and then proceed with various prototypes and ways of 3D printing these instruments using things like terracotta and other materials in order to find out how they could be turned into playable instruments. There was a residency previously as well at MPAC where this was kind of explored from Uh, a musical standpoint of how to compose for these instruments, how to play these instruments, and just figuring out what kind of sounds they could make so that one could compose with them as well. Years, the principal photography for Before the Volcanoes Sing was filmed by Tosin and cinematographer Jeremy Glayholt in the concert hall and theater at MPAC with flautist Alethia Lozano Barretta at the Soden House and the Mayan Theater in Los Angeles with Lozano Barretta and artist Tohil Fidel Brito and in Guatemala with poet and artist Rosa Chavez. Um, one of the cool things about this piece as well is that the uh, moving image work utilizes what we call a higher order ambisonic spatial audio system system at MPAC. Ambisonics is a specific audio format developed to record, mix, and playback audio in a scalable, immersive, three-dimensional sound field. The listeners in the concert hall that got to view this film are surrounded by 64 different loudspeakers distributed across the wall and ceiling surfaces, each contributing to the sound field with their own audio channel. So this piece was something that we've been working on for I, I years now. I don't actually know the exact start date of when we started shooting or having discussions about this, but it's something that we've been working on for a really long time with lots of different elements from staging to camera movement systems. Um, we flew a camera along the side of the MPAC building for this. There were some drone shots. Um, there were there was so many different things that were incorporated it in all of the teams as well. Um, all of the audio was recorded here. The mixing was done here for the post-production. We did the color correction and editing here. And then also our amazing stage team did things like create uh, a giant reflective mini swimming pool in the theater that we shot a large portion of the film on as well, uh, right nuzzled up to a rear projection screen, which we hit with our projector in the theater to create these backdrops for the, the cinematography as well. So without further ado, um, I think we'll jump right into it and we will get to meet Clarissa and Jeremy. Did you get a chance to see the whole film, Jeremy? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, I guess I saw, yeah, I saw the final, yeah, I saw the final, the final version because there was other things I saw, but I, I did see the final, final version. It's, there were yeah. lots of versions. Yeah. There was lots no, of yeah. version yeah. underscore a underscore final dash one dash final. There will there's, be another version updated from what you saw, Jeremy, but it's more about yeah. putting subtitles for the poems that there, there are some sections that are still missing and um, and cropping it to DCI format so it can be submitted to film festival. So, yeah, I have cool. to work on that. All right. Okay. All that um, fun stuff. So before we get too into it um maybe you each could just introduce yourselves a little bit you know like what you do professionally jeremy or what 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 other aspects of work that you do and how this kind of fits into that um and then the same with with clarissa and then we can kind of move on to the project um yeah okay i'll start um my name is jeremy glayholt um i'm a cinematographer i've been working with clarissa for how so many years now? 12, I guess. <laughs> Since 2012, 2012, yeah. Since 2012, um, I've been on the projects. Um, <clears throat> I've worked in the film industry for about 20 years in several different aspects. Um, and uh, I've done like every job basically in the, in the, in the film industry. And, uh, but my passion has always been cinematography and filmmaking. Um, also an independent filmmaker. A, a filmmaker I've made my own, I've directed my own films, wrote and directed my own films, documentary short films, um, and then shoot, you know, commercial projects as well. And, uh, but my passion is in independent filmmaking and smaller projects like the projects with Clarissa. Very cool. Cl Clarissa, can you, um, do the same? Give us your spiel, give us your artist, your, your th <laughs> four my sentence. My artist spiel? Yeah. Four sentence. Let, yeah. <laughs> uh, so my name is Clarissa Tosin. I am an artist. I work across media. Um, so I work with sculpture, installation, um, satellite photographs, manipulated uh, through weavings. And I also work with video or film. I do not come from a filmmaking um, background, but I started working uh, with moving image because I was interested in trying uh, the narrative format, the immersive quality of um, that cinema can offer. Uh, performance is something that I've done also quite a bit at the beginning at uh, currently, I guess my uh, moving image works are very much informed by performance um, work, but I, I I do not have a long um, history of doing uh, live performance. It really comes through um, filmmaking format. And I've been practicing for, I don't know, 12, 15 years. Yeah, and so this was, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the first like feature length work yeah. that you've done, correct? Yes. That's correct. My the longest uh, moving image piece that I had done before was a little bit short of 20 minutes. So it was like 19, 18 minutes and it was um, dance performance in an undermined revival house, the Hollyhock House designed by Frank Lloyd Wright with performer, choreographer, Crystal Sepulveda and Jeremy also was the DP. So as Jeremy mentioned, we've been working together since 2012. I do not make many films. It's usually one every three years or so. So we've done, I think, five of those together. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one was by far the most complex, the one that took the longest time to make, but also uh, we had the luxury of having impact support and to be able to push the project um, to a different level than what we had done before. Yeah, and I was I was wondering, you know, I uh, 
I'm always very interested in this relationship between the artist and the cinematographer and the operator and the editor and sort of how those relationships are navigated in a way and how, how the creativity of all the different people can be brought in. And, you know, you guys seem to have found a way to work really well together of both having visions that, that you have going into a project as well as, you know, being on set with all of you uh, as well of just, you know, things coming up and creatively being able to spontaneously explore different things or try different things. Um, do you guys have, you, you know, anything other than just the way it happened as far as like a working plan or relationship as far as how you think of the camera and what it captures, you know, as far as like a traditional director of photography, is, is there anything, Jeremy, you feel that is very different in working with an artist rather than working in a commercial sense of director of photography of where you're kind of responsible for lighting and frame, whereas I imagine it, in juxtaposition for me example, I, I only work with artists for the most part, so I have a very different way of interfacing with that is that do you do you feel a very different relationship in those ways and able to introduce yourself into it in a different way um yeah absolutely um you know i think there's always any director cinematographer relationship there a cinematographer is just most likely spent a lot more time on set a lot more time in the field, right? Because a director and us, an artist as well, um, they, like you said, does a project every three years or so, right? So the actual shooting time is limited, right? There's so much preparation time. There's so much time built around that. And I'm a cinematographer, you're always working. So you're always on set. So you're, so you've just built up the, the, that vocabulary, um, um, the onset vocabulary uh, so much more. So I think that's, that's always like a really important aspect of that relationship, uh, bringing that knowledge and that experience into, into this. And um, when Clarissa and I first met in the first project, right, it was, she, she asked me if I wanted to go to the Amazon and shoot, shoot a film. And I said, yes, absolutely. And we went down there, the two of us, and we made a film, you know, it was just, just us. We found some amazing people down there to help us, but it was really just the two of us. So we kind of were thrown into this to some of the toughest environments immediately and had to figure out how to work together and how to make a film together. And then, and like Clarissa was saying, she, she had made a lot of films up to that point. Um, um, so I had, you know, I had a bit more experience on the filmmaking side. So like immediately um, that, that, that asked that, that part of, of, uh, my experience came was extremely valuable right off the bat. And um, I, I mean, you, you always bring that in as a cinematographer, but it was just like to work that closely with somebody on, and that intimate, intimately with somebody it completely changes um, the experience. And I, I find it so much more valuable, so much more um, impactful to, to kind of cease to, to, the challenge there, right, is then to like see that vision and really help to bring it um, into the camera and capture it. And Clarissa has really specific vision. She has, um, she she plans things out extremely well. She draws it all out. She does everything she can to give you the concept. And then to help bring that into the camera with the knowledge uh, that I have, it's just, it's, it's just, it's, um, it, it feels, it feels, it's just, it's, I'm having a hard time explaining this, but it just feels it's it's like a really amazing experience, and I I prefer it a great deal to the commercial experience, where which is great in the commercial experience, you working with all these like amazing technicians and things like that, but um, but you kind of get it gets a bit diluted in the filmmaking process, and then when working with Clarissa, like I'm involved in every bit of the process once we're filming. Um, I'll yeah. jump in. I yeah. I'm very grateful for how generous Jeremy has been since the beginning with me because as he mentioned, I invited him to come to the Amazon to do this project and we had a really, really small budget, right? It was only the two of us. 
he basically had the knowledge of everything. And I had done some videos before, but in a very, um, you know, it was like myself and the camera in the studio and a microphone, and that was it. And in the Amazon, I, you know, it was not a... Um, was a place where I was like, let's bring everything that we need. We were visiting the um, Ford Company rubber towns from the 1920s. And they are like small towns in the middle of the Amazon. In the end, the infrastructure there was better than I was expecting. But there was nothing like we can run to, you know, a camera store and resolve any, any issue. So... And he just uh, embraced the idea and the challenges and the limited knowledge that I had in terms of uh, supporting him in the work that he had to do. And uh, and I've learned so much. And through working with him in like the sec this project that then later we went to uh, Michigan, Upper Peninsula to film another um Ford Company Town. I, you know, I think I was still very uh, discovering on on how to work with a GP. Uh, but I know that we have uh, a creative relationship that goes beyond uh, what perhaps a traditional director and GP does, and maybe because I come from. Um, an art background and Jeremy's wife is an artist too. So I know that he's, he's seen the family. He knows how to perhaps understand the language of uh, um, um, artists and just in, embrace it. And I've, I found out that actually we had um, um, very similar sensibilities when um, it came to the cinematography, the how things would look visually, that I could really just talk with Jeremy, try, explain, show a few references, and we would get there where I, I wanted to get. And and what happens, like jumping to today, eight years later or nine years later, I know that actually uh, I don't need to be so controlling in my explanations. And there is for this project before the Volcano Sink, that is a which is um impact commission, there was a lot of back and forth. And since the beginning, I was like, Jeremy, I'm working on this project. I don't know everything yet, but I want you to just be part of this process here. A little bit of information. And um and there was a lot of um scenes and situations, especially what we did at um uh, impact there, there was a lot of input from Jeremy so it's it's really a collaboration the reflective pool in the theater right because um I think we really got at this point of being able to envision things together because we've already done so many projects together that there is um, a mutual um, trust like creatively speaking so yeah, yeah, and every project I do, I I learn more, and 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 then I want to experiment something else for the next project, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and just to explain a little bit, as far as you know, not everyone will have the ad the opportunity to see the film that might be listening to this, and since it is uh, audio mm -hmm. and not visual, one of those things we were referencing was this this kind of I want to say giant um, mirrorless, yeah. uh, you know, peerless mini pool that uh, the stage technologies team at MPAC built in the theater, um, Jeff, Mike, and Sarah. And we kind of built this maybe inch and a half of water, rubber floored um, giant pool that that kind of sat up against a large rear projection screen that was hit with our um, 30,000 lumen projector in the theater to create this reflective um mirror like surface that then alethia and the the flutes and this the sculpture could kind of be in um and that was accompanied by lots of visuals and video and projection that was behind it in order to create a lot of these scenes that were in the film um one thing that you were talking about that you both were talking about that i thought was interesting is 
there there is something that often happens in production at MPAC as well is that artists are kind of thrown into this situation where they walk into a room and suddenly there's they're used to working with one or two people or working by themselves and then they get thrown into this situation where um, maybe for Jeremy you're used to being with even more people than that on an, on a normal production than what we do but suddenly you have 10 to 12 people aiding in this process of making the work and what I find is that maybe what you were alluding to Jeremy as well of that you get to have your hand in all forms of the production when it's a small team that you kind of are forced to go slow sometimes and you get to see things develop and you're not on this schedule that's very tight and in my experience impact production scheduling is much looser than a corporate style film shoot or anything like that but there still is for an artist coming into that fresh this this urgency of this is when we're doing this and hopefully we got all the footage and if we didn't well that's what we have time for um and i'm just wondering what that experience was like for you clarissa and for jeremy if any of that is apl applicable but you know i remember in the shooting that there was time at the beginning where it sort of felt a bit more tense that it was like are we getting it do we have everything and it seemed like we were kind of trying to plow through all the things that we wanted uh but then after a couple days it sort of we hit a a stride where everything was kind of getting getting in the bag and the shots were getting made and it seemed like we were we were doing well but I just your your experience of going into that environment if there's anything you have to share on that I loved it can we do it again that's not sadly that's not up to me but I would I would gladly have you all back uh it was very fun it was um you both. yeah it, it was certainly the I've never worked with so many people uh, before. Um, over the years, I was able to raise better and better budgets and be able to work with more people, but they were always very reduced um, teams, right? And I was always directing and doing three other things right? Uh, why? So I'm doing a little bit of production. I can be capturing the sound. I can be the second assistant to Jeremy and I'm, all, you know, and, and, and helping, um, I don't know, with the whatever needs that the person that we are filming has. I'm, I'm like always like multitasking, um, which um, it's how it goes and it's fine, but it's obviously it takes away the the possibility of only immersing yourself into the vision that you are trying to accomplish, because there are so many pragmatic things that need to be done and that I need to be aware of everything. So the, the experience at, at Impact kind of like opened up the space where I could be more in the, the creative process and not so much having to do the production around it. And I think I had the opportunity to grow as a director and I also understand more of the process because I was uh, exposed to um, different parts of um, the process. Like we, we worked with like stage design that is very specific and as a whole team doing that and the the film has also a strong music component so we we filmed at the uh impacts concert hall and uh i had to deal with the the recording the sound recording team at impact and have conversations at a much more uh refined technical level than I've ever had before and working with a composer and a flautist, a musician. So it was, it was like endless and priceless, uh, all the experiences that I had along the way. Um, if anything, it's hard to go back to my regular, you know, uh, feel, um, um, moving image, uh, uh production uh, size without having impact support um 
so I yeah I don't know Jeremy yeah um I I I agree I you know it's really wonderful when we we shoot our intimate projects and work together but um what we're losing is you you always seem to you know go swing with things but like we're losing your ability to kind of step away and just see it as an artist as a director right because you have to play so many roles you're producing oh wait we got to get here at this time and i have this you know you're like getting all the locate your location manager your producer your director your creative and it's a lot and um you pull it off but um this time we really had an opportunity for you to just concentrate on being the artist and directing um and you you know, when I talk about the other productions, um, what I'm talking about is how departmentalized they get, and which is great because separating things by department, it makes things really efficient. Um, in the film industry, it just, just goes a bit far, but at M Impact, they do that as well, right? Because everyone's an expert in their own field, and it's, it's amazing because you can just lean on them. But they also, um, what I really loved about working there is everyone would work together. Like when somebody needed help, if their project was bigger, everyone else would jump in, you know, they wouldn't take away from what they were doing, but they were always there. And so you felt this great collaboration. Everyone was working together. There was this big team that was, um, had these experts in each field, but also were ready to jump in on each project to make sure it got done. Cause it did like that. Um, the, um, reflective pool took a lot of energy and a lot of different skills and talents and it all came together, um, with that crew. So yeah, it was really, and um, you know, in also as a cinematographer, it freed me up to you know really kind of step back and just concentrate a little more on the talking to the lighting designer and um, if somebody else was operating, Ryan would be operating, talk to him about what we're looking for in the shot, and also just like trusting him, knowing that he's a very talented DP and operated himself, and let him go do kind of do his own thing at times and, and bring in suggestions. And, um, I, it, you know, everybody had suggestions and everyone was really respectful, but also just brought these really great, um, interesting collaborative minds. You can tell that this crew works with artists all the time because they're, they, they, and this is why I imagine everyone there really likes to work there. Hopefully they do, um, is that they do get to really collaborate in their position and not just like a worker, they're not just there to like, this is all I do, and then I step away. Like they become a part of the project and it becomes a collaborative experience. Um, so yeah, it, it, it will be tough. I think in general, even if we get a bigger crew, it won't necessarily be the same collaborative experience that we had at Impact. Um and just having their support throughout was really, I think, valuable when we were going to Guatemala and things like that, knowing that, that the support was there, I feel like was a huge help too. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, the, um, let's say something that I have no uh, intentions of getting to the point where I'm able to do like something like a Hollywood production. That's not my goal as a, um, an artist that wouldn't mean a successful uh, production for me necessarily. I do uh, prefer, and I the, having um, a process that is more collaborative, as uh, Jeremy mentioned. Uh, I learn more through that, and uh, it's just overall so much more fulfilling. And that's not something that the film industry does, or for whatever reasons, it might be impossible for them to operate that way. But uh, I would rather absolutely work with smaller crews that can be more um, collaborative and interactive because that's that's how we work. And that's how I specifically for this um, film, but in general, that's how I if I work with other people, I consider them collaborators. So they're there must be some level of exchange and, and opening, and it's not just each person um, uh, just carry out, carrying out a, a task in a very isolated way. This is not interesting to me. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and just to mention in this uh, film, so I collaborated with 
a composer, a musician, an archaeologist, uh, two contemporary Mayan artists, one um, Rosa Chavez, who is mostly a poet, but is also a multimedia artist, Tohil Brito Bernal, who's uh, a visual artist, mostly working with painting and drawing and performance. So, uh, and Alethe Lozano Birueta, who's the, uh, the flautist, the musician. So even the process of putting together what the film would be had a lot of collaboration. So we felt also very natural to approach the experience at MPAC as this big collaboration with MPAC's team. And, um, I should also mention that the film was not only shot in Impact, we shot in Guatemala, we shot in Los Angeles, and our crews, both in Guatemala and LA, were much smaller, and we did a lot of work during the pandemic, during the lockdown, so there was like one uh, instance where it was just uh, Aletia, the flautist Jeremy and I filming in front of all the Mayan revival houses in LA from like public space and that we did in 2020 so it was again one of like those moments that was a really minimum crew um, it's such an integral but, part of the film but we we made it and then there was other moments that were super elaborate and technical as the reflective pool at NPAC's um theater so it's the the scope also of how the film was uh filmed and put together i think embraced all those levels of production that we've already experienced throughout the years yeah i was i was wondering too um so adding on to some of those things, and since Jeremy here as well, I think it's it's relevant, but um, I was looking, I watched before this Chumaya, the other video, one of the other video works of yours that, that I've seen. Um, and I was wondering if there's anything that you could elaborate on regarding the filming technique sort of differences that exist between that work and and this work and sort of if any of that technique uh you, you know there's a lot of locked off camera there's a lot of static camera in chumaya where it feels you know there's these multiple plates of 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 shooting on a same locked off location and then as an operator myself in this film um as a volcano sing is there's there's a lot of movement you know there's a lot of constant sort of movement and it. it almost seems like the, the tripod shot in a way is not necessarily present even when it is locked off there's almost always this sort of pan or there is a um, rotation and from a rigging and technical standpoint we going back to the idea of a large production team you know we really had a lot of shoots with this film where i think even on our end and probably with jeremy too we had ideas but we didn't know what it was going to look like, you know, so we built various camera rigs and things that were mounted in the top of the concert hall at an angle, sliding up and down the concrete curtain in the concert hall. We did a lot of steady cam work um, and we had the, the peerless pool with a crane, uh, steady cam in the water with it, you know, tripods in it with the water. Um, but I just was thinking in terms of the movement that's present in this film and how that's also in like the Mayan theater and the concert hall and how those, those movements are kind of duplicated in these various spaces. Um, just think if those techniques or the approach of how it was filmed visually had anything to do specifically with the content or a shift or just something you were interested yeah. in, in the filmmaking process. Yeah. I, so when, um, Jeremy and I started talking about this project. I remember that my first idea that I shared with him is I want to have a lot of movement because the this film will bring music and architecture together. And I wanted to make this connection between the flute structures, the resonance chambers inside the flutes and the architectonic spaces where we were filming in. I'll let Jeremy talk from a more technical perspective on how uh, we got to where we got and his suggestions and 
um, the choices that, that he made, that we made together, but the idea of movement was very much um, from, from the start. Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, <clears throat> from in my, when the start of this film is so long ago now. <laughs> it took so long to get, because we had to, we, we had to get through a pandemic in the middle of it um, that didn't help with timing and it was a long film in general to make. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it, it, thinking back, it was, it was, yeah, the, about the, the movement of air through the flute, I feel like was one of the early uh, things that you brought up to me and visually, like, I immediately saw that I was really drawn to that, that concept of like, uh, the fluidity of the movement of air and, um, and so I saw movement, I also saw the movement as being very fluid, um, rather than there is movement in Chumaya in the dance, um, performance and we ended up actually going handheld and making it really chaotic and it was amazing I really loved that part of the film and shooting that part of the film because I think it broke away from all the stagnant shots um, but this one um, you know there was a little bit of talk of like mixing in some of that chaos um, in the end it didn't as we started filming as we started compiling the film it didn't really make sense to that would have felt an, forced in a way to add that sort of like handheld chaos to the film. Um, I always, I, I mean, in general, as an aesthetic, I, I usually like to try to add some, some handheld in to a film, but it's all, it's really about each project. Um, so the fluidity of the movement and, and, and the constant movement, it, it was a concept in the beginning, but as the film was coming together, it, we kept coming back to it. Um, we would constantly think about what we've been filming, what we're going to be filming, and how they're going to tie together and how this film's going to look in the end. And as an experimental film, it's really difficult to see it in the end, especially since a lot of this is still, I mean, we collaborate really well. I can see Clarissa's vision, but I can only see so much. A lot of it is, is in Clarissa's head. So I have to really trust her. And I do, like, that's working together this long. Um, and she probably sees my face sometimes where I'm like, is that, you know, like, what's is that? That's going to be weird. But I just go, okay, let's do it. And I trust you. And it all, I, every time I see the edits coming together, I'm like, oh yeah, I see what she's doing. It's, it's beautiful. It's brilliant. Um, so I have to really trust things, but it, in the, it, in the overall sense, like keeping that fluidity, um, it was always in the back of our heads. I don't think we're always just like, well, we have to have movement. We have to have movement. A lot of it just kept coming together like that. We had that that concept and that design to keep the fluidity of the camera movement throughout. But it also just, even if we were gonna do a lock off shot, something would always come in to keep it moving. And it just sort of, it kept making sense to keep that that movement in it. It's it's actually almost surprising to me how much movement in the end we um, uh, throughout all the shots that we had. But it, it at the same time, it all made sense. Like we, we you know, and it's how we work together. We really, we design the film, but things change a great deal, especially with a film this big, especially with an experimental film. There's so, there's going to be so many changes, so many additions and things like that. But each time we go to film something, we talk about it, we discuss it, we discuss the overall film, where it might go, where it has been coming. And, and that informs each, each, um, each day of filming. And I think, um, which is great because you can see it how it always really locks together because sometimes you can get really lost and forget where you're going and completely change your style. But we were very lucky to be able to kind of keep keep our um, our aesthetic together throughout the filming process of four years. Well, but I think it comes from this idea when I uh, say that there is creative trust between Jeremy and I is that, of course, that there are moments that I, we are filming that I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to experiment with something. And I think we know now uh, that we can allow um, a little moments to do that uh, without losing track completely. Because, yes, it is... Uh, a possibility if you go too far or if you spend too much time doing something that turns into nothing and doesn't make it into the final edit but also to in order to work on films that are more experimental or at least for me i feel that i i i need to create a structure that allows a little bit of diversion here or there because we can benefit from that 
the the in the process, right? And I think, as usual, we capture so much that I think it could have added a, a completely different film, and I can revisit the footage that was not used and and do something else, and <laughs> right, that's the usually the case. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, we, it, you know, for instance, Guatemala, like we could only guess so much of what it was going to be like down there, of what we were going to, I mean, you can research so much, you can get as much information, but until you get there and start filming, you can't, you can't fully create um, that, that experience. And that's part of what's so exciting about filmmaking, especially a film like this. It was because when we started filming down there, it was, it was very challenging, but then things just were happening that were just magical and just fit in the film perfectly. Like, oh, this space, just makes sense for what we've already filmed. Like this makes sense for what we are filmed. Having filmed a lot of the other stuff beforehand, I think really helped inform it, but it was just, it was just incredible. It was just like everything seemed, even though um, we couldn't have fully planned for it, everything just to seem, seemed to make sense and seemed to fit in the film so perfectly. Um, yeah. yeah, and as an example of that is we filmed that MPAC, uh, all the reflective pool sections with Aletia before we went to Guatemala. And Aletia, is, there are moments that she's just like playing with the water. And I didn't have exactly a script for that. It was more like, oh, try this movement, walk this way, let's do that. It was very spontaneous and decided us we were filming and then when we were in Guatemala with poet Rosa Chavez she does this uh, performance at the Lake Atlitan with two rocks and somehow her movements which I had absolutely no idea what she would be doing she told me that she would do like a, a performance with rocks in the water and I was like great and her movements are kind of almost like mirroring the movements that Aletia did at the concert hall so uh editing them uh together it also it felt as if we had planned all of that and it's actually a beautiful coincidence on how um this film came together so lots of amazing good surprises throughout this process yeah yeah i was um i was wondering too which you both alluded to a little bit about how much was shot and how it does feel like there are so many different films inside of the film. Like there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot in there that any bit of it could be unpacked into this bigger, larger thing. And, and I'm wondering how you navigated the artistic choice of how much feels, some of it feels slightly documentary some of it feels very abstract visual art film. Um, some of it is musical performance. Uh, some of it, you know, so was there a way that you were trying to navigate? I want it to feel, I need to get this information across in order to make sure that certain things are brought to the forefront, like the flutes or the locations, but I don't want it to feel too over the head about the documentary side of it or the story of it um, and just how you kind of rode that line if there was one between the, in, in an art film that's very visual and the narrative almost documentary side of the film. Yeah, I do have a tendency of making um, moving image works that are more immersive and performatic. That's my go to place right and for this film i really felt the need of bringing forward some important information to contextualize my choices that are more like as i said um performative visual immersive so it, it, i I tend not to do anything like video essays, things that are extremely based on a linear narrative or explanation or a logic. It's I I prefer just to take the viewer into a journey that hopefully uh, some um, 
relationships and connections between the parts that are presented are going to make sense and they will make sense in different ways for different people right so it was i it, it took me a moment to figure out when we filmed in guatemala i was like let's go with the uh, documentary approach for this because i have I know which locations we are going. I know the history of each one of these locations. The locations were picked by uh, poet Rosa Chavez. She's Guatemalan, and she made the choice of the locations based on um, her poetry and ancestral knowledge that made sense with her work. So those, she picked, we decide together, but she she was the one guiding us, right? And uh, it was my first time in Guatemala. I hadn't met her before. We had tons of, uh, you know, Zoom conversations, but that that was the extent of our collaboration up to that point. So the the approach was very documentary like, but it was my first time also doing that in in that strict way where we are kind of almost like interviewing people, right? Jeremy and I, both in in the Amazon and Recife in Brazil, we 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 filmed in a documentary like style, but a little bit more loose because the uh, this this approach of finding interesting things in the world, but not trying to fit in the format of I have a narrative, I have an argument, and I'm going to construct this documentary where I'm going to explain something, right? It has never been like this. This was the first one that was perhaps a little bit more structured in that way. And then what happened is that I edited uh, with Andrew Van Baal, which was, is our um, second camera in uh, in Guatemala. We edited things in a very um, linear, narrative-based, clean-cut documentary just to have all the content. And then I was like, okay, now I have to deconstruct this. Now I have to intercept this with a little bit of performance. There is no way that I can use this in this uh, linear fashion. Um, and I think in the end, I, I hit the, the, the balance that I find, uh, the balance that works for me, where I really went to the, found the, the sentences and then things that, that were said by the, the main characters, the main people we met in, in, in Guatemala. Uh, just the key points. I don't need to give, you know, all the, the, the explanation of everything. I think the, the important things that were said are there and they are um, an invitation to entering that world. That's how I saw that part of the, the film. But that's something that I am interested in exploring further. And I hope I'll be able to do in the next projects. It's like how to use uh, documentary filmmaking to actually create hybrid formats that don't stay in what is conventionally thought as documentary. Great. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about briefly was, you know, that it seems like architecture is another character in this to some degree, you know, everything from a lot of pieces of it feel very landscape, you know, the navigation of the flutes and sort of these sunrises that come over the side of the flute. And we were using that probe lens to kind of traverse the tops of these um, terracotta things to the point that they feel like rocks or sand dunes that you're you're kind of flying over and then the focus on the architecture in the concert hall and along the side of the concert hall as we did that large dollying shot on a cable that ran across um, and I'm just was wondering if you could both of you talk yeah, you know, and then also the Mayan theater, right? And and kind of this juxtaposition of these two architectures and these two places, um, just a little bit to break down conceptually the idea behind that architecture as such an important subject, um, and how it how how you chose to capture those spaces. 
do you want to talk about conceptually and then I'll talk about how we capture them? Uh, so I'll talk briefly conceptually because I can. I know it's probably uh, I think very it's long, but. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I, um, so architecture has been in my work forever. I grew up in Brasilia, which is this experimental modern um, urban plan, the capital of Brazil, right? And uh, I think through architecture, architectonic spaces are just like a very early part of my visual language. I came to age in, in that city and I just, I guess I just think th through architecture. So I, um, all my films in one way or another uh discuss a specific size or either like histories of buildings or the ideology behind some certain kinds of um, architecture or um, it, it's, I don't, the, the choices that I may make of um, location and anything related to the built environment are very specific. So that's just like one, uh, foundation of my work and um so all the films that that Jeremy and I did together they are very much uh rooted on histories related to buildings and specific urban spaces right so we start developing a language to film buildings and film architectonic space and film cities and I think I'm, I'm still um figuring that out every project I do and every project has a specific question or a proposition and and we depart from there and I'll let and we discuss a lot about that since since the beginning so I feel that also we are at a point now where I can easily say oh remember what we did that or how we do that thing so maybe we use a little bit of that and then we try something else but I'll let Jeremy, maybe yeah. you take the conversation and if yeah. I think about something else specific. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, we all, all of our films have been dealt with um, architecture. And to me, it, like the architecture has always been like the base of everything. Like we, we start with that and then we build off of that. And um, as you're talking about it, I'm kind of thinking of how we made this film and how we worked with the architecture. And it, it was really interesting because I guess from a, uh, as a cinematographer, as we would think about, for instance, filming Tohil at the um, the Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. Um, space in Los Angeles, it was so did House. Thank you. Um, it was sort of how he can move work within the space, like how the architecture would fit around him, and um, how he can like move through the space and sort of in a way I felt like take ownership of the space, but. Um, it was always kind of like, you know, whereas before we were working more with the space itself and in Chumaya, we were working performance within the space as well, but we also worked a lot with the space itself and how we capture different moments of the space. And in this, it was sort of more about how the subject can work within the space, how uh, Alethia would work uh, within the, the front spaces of the, um, the other uh, Mayan block homes throughout Los Angeles, how, um, um, it, with Tohil and the Soden House, and even in Impact, like how we we would work with the space itself and moving through it and capturing it, the architectural elements of the space, but also Alethia within the space, like performing within the space. It always came around to like how we worked within these architectural spaces, which again came off of this. Um, a lot of that dealt with um, again with the flute and the resonant sound working through the spaces and flowing through these spaces. So we kind of always kind of saw the spaces from that point of view, which tied them together really well, even, um, and that went for the, the theater and MPAC, the Mayan theater. And I felt even in Guatemala, this, you know, we were constantly, it was like working with this, the, um, the Tamascal, like her within the space of the Tamascal, even, it's filming exteriors at um, at uh, Lake Atitlan, um, it kind of, we're still kind of within the, the volcanic backdrop, like how we worked within that space and how she was framed within that space and how like she was with the water and the volcano. So it all kind of, um, it was about like working with 
these these different architectural elements um, throughout the film. Yeah, and like you were saying, I'm sure that that there's there's hours of conceptual ideas to explore that are loaded into architectural space, but that there is obviously the histories and usages of these space and then activating these specific spaces with these people and these histories. And, you know, there's, there's so much there that's being said by these people inhabiting and existing in, in these spaces as well. Um, that I think is really interesting. And then, hard for me as to, to see all of it, but you know, it's, it's nice to have an impact part of that in whatever way it is, you know, that the concert hall exists in a way within those spaces as well. Um, and it's, it, it's very interesting to think about how it all plays together. Yeah. Yeah. And in this, in this film, we have, um, um, these three subjects that are, who are, um, telling our story or bringing the narrative together. There is example of other films that uh, um, we did in the past, which was just the architectonic spaces, like the Broad Museum that we filmed during the pandemic. And it was a film very, then very much the, the, the building becomes a character. I did, and it was a moment where uh, no one was allowed it into the building. So it was like the peak of like 2020, um, work at home <laughs> uh, moment and I so we I was asked to do to do a film only about a, the, the Broad Museum um, building and I, I request I was like listen at least can we have some installers no I the, the, the film the, the building has to have some life and uh, human beings activate <laughs> uh, uh, buildings we, we are not filming uh, a ruin yet it might become a ruin in the future. But it was, I mentioned this because it was a, a different experience in, in how uh, most of what we filmed was this architectonic structure outside, inside, inside had then some um, uh, obviously artworks. And we played with the light a lot because the presence or the absence of light and shadows is, is, is what then would uh, um, uh, make the film, the, the building perform in a certain way, or that's how I saw. So there was always uh, those considerations that go uh, with using any of those spaces. But as, as, as Jeremy pointed out, in the in this film specifically and with the southern house and to heal uh fidel at the, at the house was very much about him claiming that space and using that house as hymns so it's um it was a completely different we we didn't a uh, way of doing that we didn't want to highlight the architectonic space for the sake of the beauty of the architectonic space but make that space be his space he's the the, the important, obviously, part of all those sections. Yeah. Um, great, thanks. I, I have one one last question, and then we can, can wrap things up a little bit, but perhaps because I'm slightly biased to it, but, uh, you know, could you, as you think about this, you know, for again, for people who are unable to experience it, you know, we, we were able to present it on a 60-foot screen, um, we did it a 64 channel uh, ambisonic dome in which all of this audio was was presented on. Um, there was there was an ambisonic mix of the piece, uh, all spatialized throughout the space. The we did some editing here at the end. We did all the color correction here at the end, as well as that sound mix. And I'm just wondering, you know, if this was, I assume maybe the first time you've gone through that whole detailed of a process in, in this going through in the filmmaking um, and how that was as far as an, a, a space to edit in and, you know, how that all kind of materialized on the impact side production-wise. Um, is that something that now in the future has just been molded into the way that you plan to work? Um, and, yeah, if you have any thoughts on any of that. Yes, I, I would love to work again uh, this way. I have to say that this is the second project that I've 
got some help with editing. I'm a very hands-on uh, person when it comes to making my artwork, be it you know material things, as I mentioned, like sculptures, installation, or filmmaking too. So I um, up to Chumaya, I edited a hundred percent of my um, works, art, uh, videos, or uh, moving image of works, um, and. Um, the Broad Museum um, film and and this one were the first ones that I got help editing, and it's a it's a very different process because I you know I have to explain more. Um, as I mentioned before, the space of experimentation is important for me, so it's like one thing that I'm still um, trying to figure out is how I can still have those moments where I'm just like, leave me alone for a second and let me play with this so I can figure this out because it's, I have a sense of what I want, but if I try to explain, maybe it will not translate into words in a very, um, easy way for someone else to understand, or even a storyboard. I, so I try to do sometimes the storyboards after the fact, just as a way to, help the editor to work with me right but I still like to have the moment where like I am doing things and I'm playing around because that's a, that's how I think that the film comes together in a very organic way I need that that's part of my process and with color it was again the first time that I had um amazing Ryan doing the color correction for <laughs> for me but that I had like a professional working on that and it's a whole world opened up I think I understand much better the the, the what it takes to do certain things I at the beginning I had some expectations that I would be able to do all these amazing amazing changes and erase things and do this and that and it's a lot of work so it, it's good to know exactly what it goes into doing this post -produ the post-production work so you you know how to plan better while you were filming right? The things that you let go or the things that you plan really well so you don't run into problems later. I don't think we ran into any major problems, but um, there are things that I wish I had done slightly different and I, I've learned through the process. Um, but obviously the quality of the, the film is so different from anything else I've done before because you have this like very refined tuning of color. And I should mention also that we use like different cameras throughout this four years. Cap we capture footage in completely different conditions. So putting everything together and making everything look like belonging to the same world is a lot of work, right? Not the kind of work I would be able to do on my own. But I would, would also like to learn a little bit more and be able to do myself again because it's a part of my process right we ended this um uh our week of doing color correction together and i'm like all excited now to learn how to use resolve da vinci so that next time we work together i'm more you know prepared to go back and forth and somehow uh participate in the process in a more active way or be able to have ideas on how to resolve things because I understand better the process. That's how it works for me, which again goes against maybe the way that the film industry works where everything is so compartmentalized. I feel that I can obvi obviously having very talented uh, people working with me, like both of you, only me makes the project grow in, in ways that I can't imagine beforehand. But I really like to see this uh, working together as like collaborators. So, and, he, and then in the sense, it's like, oh, I can go there and experiment a little bit too. I can learn through this process and suggest things or um, be, be part of that and not only um, giving directions for things people to do things, which is also part of the process. And there is a lot of that, but I, I like to, to create, have some boundaries that are a little bit more fluid. So, so we can get to 
to results that hopefully you don't get in when you engage with processes that are more um, sterile and compartmentalized. But yeah, I would love to have color correction with you forever, Ryan. That's it. Yeah, well, I, I always <laughs> say that it's kind of Pandora's box. It's like once you kind of open that up in the workflow and you know figure out what you can or can't do in that, it's very hard to go through that yeah. process ever again without saying, hold on, like we need to color correct our film. We can't just, you know, yeah, just, just edit it together just... and have it be done. And, you know, it's kind of this this integral part. Um, and also I have to say that we, we, tr we try to do everything to look real, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, it, it, it's, we have a, like skin tones looking like skin tones. We have a, Sure, we, we, we went a little bit more dramatic in the architectonic spaces. We wanted it to be a little saturated and darker, but the spaces still look very much like they look in real life. Now that I understand better the capabilities of um, uh, color correction and the next work that I'll be doing, it's about the moon. I just want something that is completely unrealistic because we can do that, right? It's just a matter of... Um, figuring out what you want to do and and having the time to then um, do that painterly job. For me, it felt like painting in a way. I'm not, I don't have a painting background, by the way, but it has yeah. that level of- You had a very natural, you, you, were, you were able to pick it up very naturally, I feel, of like, you know, the uh, uh, a painterly aspect of how you get color is not by subtracting color, it's by adding color is a, is a way for color correctors to think that often is difficult for some to pick up. You know, you, you don't take away green to make the green go away. You you add colors on the opposite side of the color wheel to get certain things to go away or to be added to. Um, but yeah, it seemed like you got a knack for it. You can just pick up a whole other career in the process if you Oops. want, <laughs> in all the free time. <laughs> all the free time yeah. I have, exactly. Yeah. Now I know how to use it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, Thanks so much for talking with me. If you guys have any last things you want to say, feel free. But it was uh, a pleasure to have been able to work with both of you over the span of the project. And hopefully we get to work together soon. And I'm very proud of all the work at MPAC and you did on it. It looks really beautiful. Um, so congratulations and thanks for talking. Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, really a special experience working with MPAC. Um, like Clarissa said, it's going to be tough <laughs> not having that support. It was just the whole system, everything around it uh, was, was was just so uh, valuable to the film. And just the support of um, the crew there, for sure, but also um, big support on every, every, every kind of um, time we ran into a roadblock. It was like, why don't you do this? And it, it was just the film just all always um, it was better for it was always the better for those um, those challenges that we came across so yeah it was amazing yeah thank you the whole team at MPAC is just incredible and Vic Brooks the the curator has been a super amazing supported throughout this process because as, as we mentioned before we we started this project and then COVID hit and it was it was not an easy uh, project and an easy way to to do this project that changed it so many times. And she was always, no, we are going to find a way to make this happen. So and here it is. We we found it's amazing. I'm very proud and, and grateful and looking forward to do more and better. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much has been able to push through that whole COVID craziness you know there, yeah. there was so many productions that were really in the works during all that and it's so nice to finally have this this kind of culmination of all of these things that had been happening now kind of burst out you know and, and be seen and that's that's a lot of what's going on here at MPAC right now so it's really great um well thank you again I appreciate it I'll let you guys get on with the rest of your day and uh I'll hopefully talk to you soon Thank you. Thank you. Say hello to everyone.
Thanks for listening. In Production is produced by me, Ryan Jenkins, along with Vic Brooks and Ashley Farrow Murray, with the support from everyone here at MPAC. Both a center for the media and performing arts and a research and production facility, MPAC at Rensselaer hosts artists and residents year round to support the realization of complex artworks and research projects at any stage from inception to completion. To find out more about MPAC, visit www.mpac.rpi.edu and our Instagram account at EMPAC underscore RPI. All opinions expressed here belong solely to those featured in this episode and are not representative of Rensselaer.